So good morning. It's the uh, third day of the conference, and I know I'm f following a couple of really excellent plenary lectures. And so I'll try to uh, do my best this morning to do at least as well as uh, Professor Lagudis and Professor Kundu. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, bio-inspired pneumatic artificial muscle actuator design and really focused on two areas. One is aerospace applications and one is robotics. And uh, one of the key things I want to stress here is that, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, that uh, a lot of the work that I do is supported by a host of people, including graduate students, postdocs, uh, collaborators, and colleagues. And without them, a, a lot of things that I accomplish wouldn't be possible. So I want to thank them all uh, for all their hard work. And I've listed some of the ones that have worked here uh, on these uh, PAM projects, including uh, Ben Woods, who's now at Swanson University, finished his PhD, and Ryan, who's in the audience, he spoke on Monday, uh, Robert Vokey, Erica Hawking, and uh, Mike Gentry. Of course, Erica and Mike both work at the Navy right now, so they're graduated. So I'll start with an introduction and background, and then, uh, so uh, pneumatic artificial muscles uh, they've been around for a long time. They were sort of created in the 50s as orthotic appliances for polio patients. And they, they go by a lot of different names. Uh, pneumatic artificial muscles, pneumatic rubber actuators, braided pneumatic actuators, air muscles. But my favorite one is rubber two aiders. You know, say that four or five times fast and it's quite interesting. Uh, these were commercialized in the 1980s by uh, Bridgestone and I've seen quite a bit of applications in robotics. And uh, the PAMs that are used uh, are different than the ones that, that I use in my lab, but uh, they were developed quite a bit by Shadow Robot Company and by Festo. And uh, uh, Festo has a, a co-cured uh, composite braid and elastomer uh, PAM. And of course, Shadow Robot has a, a quite a different configuration as well, but these are all different kinds of of PAMs that exist. And they're used for a whole host of things. And you'll see uh, a lot of applications. I've shown a few here. And anything from uh, artificial limbs to uh, insect-like robots, uh, manipulators, and so on. So it's quite a, an interesting and, and, and active field. Uh, in many ways, humanoid robots is sort of a, a really interesting application of this technology because we'd like to have robots that can do things that, that help us either through uh, rehabilitation or orthotics or even doing jobs that uh, require human dexterous or human dexterity or dexterous robots to achieve. And a lot of these applications to date really have focused on really low frequency operation things on the, the bandwidth of what a human can do, something on the order of a hertz or so. So uh, it's actually very hard for a human to move faster than about a hertz. In fact, uh, if you measure your head and re neck reflexes, which I did in 1982, the much stronger neurological institute, I found that the head and neck reflexes had a bandwidth of around one hertz. And so um, it's really a, a sort of limiting factor, or at least one that governs the innovations that you might do. And just to give you a feel how this works. So basically what you have is uh, a braid that surrounds uh, a bladder. And this bladder could be latex or silicone or some kind of a rubber or elastomer. And around that, you put around it a helical braid. And these helical braids are available from any number of companies that, that build these things. They, they usually supply them in, in long rolls. And you just take those and wrap it around. And you add an end fitting at each side. And here's an example of how, whoops, of, uh, this is a technical problem I was having earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and jump out. OK. I'll get organized here, hang on. For some reason, my flip for Mac decided to uh, 
be uncooperative this morning and won't let me run video. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do them here outside. So here's an example of a contractile pan. And you'll see right here, this is just a couple of hose clamps holding the braid onto the bladder. And that's just simple fabrication. You can actually get quite good results. And so you'll see here, as you inflate the pan, you actually get about a 30% contraction. Now this is, a, if you think about piezos, where you get maybe at best 1,000 parts per million, and say magnetostrictos, you might get say 2,000 parts per million at best. Here you're getting 30% uh, strain, which is actually a, a huge actuation capability. And you can do this with a very high block force. And again, that's one of those things that we always strive for in, in smart materials, look to have large stroke and large force, but it's very hard. This is contractile. And you can also do uh, extensile PAMs. And uh, here we're showing an extension. We can, just, so we can get also a contractile muscle and extensile muscle. The problem is you can't do both at the same time because it depends on the, the Brady angle of that weave that goes around the bladder. So there's actually a boundary below which it's contractile, above which it's extensile. So a bit of a limitation, but um, that's easily fixed. So PAMs have some unique properties. Uh, they're quite simple to make. Uh, they don't really require price ice alignment. So they're, they're flexible, so you can kind of have a misalignment and you know, cope with that quite well. They're inherently compliant, so which is a nice thing if you're interacting with humans, uh, as opposed to motors that are very stiff. Uh, low cost parts, they're quite robust and reliable, so you can take one of these PAMs, throw it on a wall, it'll still work. Try doing it the piezo stack and you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, low operational pressure, typically less than 100 PSI. Uh, they really have superior force to weight ratios. So thousands of pounds of force per pound of actuator. Uh, very large specific work, very high bandwidth, although not as high as, as piezos or magnetostrictives, but higher than say SMA. And we've actually run these uh, up to 250 million cycles. And uh, done fatigue tests and endurance tests to show that these are actually quite feasible actuators for aerospace applications. And if you can't do at least this many cycles, no aerospace company will talk to you. So it's important to at least do one test to show that you can do this. And you can do various sizes. And we've done things from as small as mo hollow monofilament fishing line all the way up to large two inch diameter hoses that we actually fabricated in the lab. So here's kind of a comparison to other actuation technologies. And, and here's you know, all of our favorites, uh, hydraulic cylinders, solenoids, piezos, uh, turfanol and galfanol and such. This is actually turfanol, SMAs, pneumatic cylinders. And if you look down here, I want to point out specific work. Of course, hydraulics is hard to beat because you can put as big a pump as you want if you can carry it. Uh, but down here, we're getting 4,400 joules per kilogram, which is comparable to SMA. We're getting a pretty good frequency range and uh, a pretty good actuation stress. And so it's a pretty good, well-sized actuator for things like uh, robotics or even things like uh, rotor blades. This kind of fits very well in that sort of regime. So of course, when you first start doing this, we, we use plumbing fittings that we bought off the master car and uh, they worked okay, but after a while they, they failed quite rapidly. Um, here we have some devices that actually used wire wrapped around the end fittings, all the hose clamps. And ultimately we have this um, sort of almost commercialized product that we're getting ready here. You'll see here it's developed by Techno Sciences, my small company collaborator that I work with. And you'll see there's actually a serial number on there. And this is a PTFE braid and here we have a Kevlar braid, so we have different equivalent models of different sizes and different materials. And you can see that they're, they're quite readily available and they, they're fairly inexpensive to buy and use. So it's a, it's a nice actuation technology. But in about, uh, I guess about three or four years, we went from a, you know, a pretty kludgy device all the way to a, essentially a product that had been endurance tested to 250 million cycles. So let's talk about modeling. So how do you use these things? Okay, so we have essentially a, a model. You probably 
If you went to the bar last night and had a beer, you did exactly this. You have an agonist, antagonist muscle in your arm, and uh, it's right there, your bicep and your tricep. And you can sort of imagine a bio-inspired actuation concept that might move, say, a flap or a manipulator or a robot joint, much, much this way. And essentially, when you increase the pressure or inflate this bottom one, it'll contract and move this flap down or this joint down. And then you have to stretch this upper uh, muscle that, that ends up being stretched. That's the antagonist. And so you have to overcome that stiffness in order to have this joint move. So these are actually bio-inspired, if you will, uh, antagonistic muscle pairs that are used to actuate various devices. And you'll see here, um, here I'm showing the force versus contraction. And uh, you can see there, you get this interesting, here's zero contraction. In this range right here, it's fairly linear. It does the, the block force where it crosses over this dashed line, does increase with pressure. And the contraction also increases with pressure. And so you'll see here that this blue curve here corresponds to block force and it's roughly linear but the contraction, which is the green curve, actually is pretty nonlinear. So the, 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 it's not a simple, a simple actuator. It just requires some, uh, some modeling effort to be put into it to be able to use it effectively. But the nice thing here is that both of these trends are very monotonic and very easy to use in controllers. <clears throat> um, another key thing is that if you have a larger diameter device, you have more force. And if you have longer length, you get more stroke. And so it's they're quite simple design rules. So here's an example of uh, uh, the, un the uninflated or deflated PAM. And here's the inflated PAM. And you'll see here you have an initial diameter of D. And it about doubles in diameter when you inflate it. So you have to account for that in your actuation volume. And here you can see as you increase the pressure up to 90 PSI, you get large changes in, in force, here you have a breed angle of 30 degrees and a breed angle of 14 degrees. That's a critical parameter in dictating what the force levels will be. So the breed angle is a critical design parameter. Um, <clears throat> one disadvantage of higher angles though, you get higher forces, but you also get higher antagonistic stiffness because the braid now is uh, more into the uh, axial direction, if you will, of the, uh, the fibers in, more in this axial direction. So <clears throat> here's a whole series of different kinds of, of, of PAMs. Here you have a Kevlar-based one, a PTFE-based one, and here's a fiberglass-based one. And uh, this one down here is quite small. It isn't the smallest that we've made. And uh, it's a quite a large range of things you can do. So it's a very versatile in terms of sizing of the actuation concept. And <clears throat> so here you can see another example <clears throat> of the actuation diagram for contraction, and there is the antagonistic force as you stretch the antagonistic muscle. And so you can see the stiffness here is quite high, and that, that leads to issues in terms of when you design your actuation scheme that you can overcome that antagonistic stiffness. <clears throat> well, why not use a conventional pneumatic actuator? You can go buy these from Parker Hannafin or any number of, of vendors and what's interesting here is you have this force which is proportional to the area of the piston. And uh, what happens here though is that there's a, there's a factor alpha that comes in with the PAMs. And this is related to this term right here. And it's kind of like the surface area, if you will, inside the PAM as it inflates. And so you get very large uh, multiplier effect, even a factor of four. And so what ends up happening here is you get a much higher actuation capability or force capability out of the PAM then you do have a comparably sized pneumatic cylinder. So that's a key advantage. And, uh, and here's an here, if you have uh, a particular angle, you have no motion and part of it will be extensile and part of it contractile. So they've been around for 50 years. Uh, I didn't invent these, but I'm trying to use them in a different regime, in a sort of more aerospace uh, field. Uh, Second dynamic modeling is still a challenge, actually, believe it or not. People are still working on this, including us. Uh, most applications require dynamic models that uh, you maybe just create a system ID technique where you find a model that has the right structure, and then <clears throat> you go back and you fit parameters. 
And we're, we're trying to develop more of a, a predictive approach uh, that's sort of a hybrid of a post-dictive and a solid mechanics or hypoelastic model. We're trying to find the right mechanisms that are physically meaningful and then sort of do the, the modeling with that <coughs> based on data collected. And so here's a, a, a series of different kinds of things that you would do. Uh, the Gaylord term is the one that's typically used. Unfortunately for, uh, this is a simple model, but unfortunately it's about, wrong by about 100% error in many cases. And it's not adequate. So you have to add different things. You have to add bl bladder energy storage, uh, braid elasticity. Uh, this is from Clute and Hannaford at University of Washington. This is out of, out of my group. And it includes some non-cylindrical tip effects. And then you get a total force looking something like this. And uh, this model tends to work pretty well. And then uh, that's an energy method. And here you have a force balance method. And this is the one we kind of like to use the most because it seems to work the best for us. And uh, these are free by diagram. You again include a bladder thickness term. Uh, we in include initial pressure dead band. So you can sort of imagine you put in a certain amount of pressure and the bladder won't inflate until you exceed the threshold pressure or a cracking pressure. Then it'll start to inflate. That's called the pressure dead band. Then we include a, a nonlinear bladder elasticity. This is sort of uh, our simplified version of hyperelasticity. And then <coughs> we add up a total force and get a, a, a model like this. And there are more refinements of this. Uh, we also add into this a, uh, a hysteresis model, and uh, we can match the data quite well with the model. So it's a pretty simple model to apply, and you just take some data, and you can get a, a pretty reasonable model fairly quickly. So we've done, investigated different modeling approaches and uh, proposed some different modeling enhancements. In fact, Ryan Robinson gave a talk on Monday of some of our most recent modeling work. and. Uh, uh, we even have some uh, highly uh, sophisticated ways of handling geometry of the braid now that allows us to get even more uh, improvements in the models. Uh, we don't yet have a pretty predictive model, and we're getting closer, and we're looking at uh, soil mechanics approaches and others. And there are lots of folks working on this. I know Conwell Wang's group and Michael Filan's group and Professor Tandu's group is working very hard also on different modeling approaches for various kinds of PAMs. And, uh, and I, sh I should say that go read their papers as well. They have some really good work. And uh, uh, <coughs> so I'm talking about applications now. And I'm, I'm kind of motivated, really, in a lot of the work that I do in, in looking at applications. So I don't do as much probably basic science as, as some faculty do. And uh, I'm much more excited about trying to get things fielded and trying to get things at work. So. We're looking at things like robotic arms. So although we're not producing robotic arms that go in the factories or in the field, we're producing pre-production or prototypical devices. And same thing is true for helicopter blades. Uh, we're looking at some servo-like devices for UAVs and some, uh, I'm gonna show you a little cartoon about some morphing wing development. So the goal for robotics is to design lightweight, scalable actuation systems with heavy lifting capabilities that can interact safely with humans. So I'm talking about a battlefield casualty extraction robot. So a robot that would go out into the field and rescue an injured soldier without putting, say, medics at risk of, of being harmed. And this robot has to pick up a, a wounded soldier, so it has to be able to pick up, be, be compliant. So when it's picking up the soldier, it can sort of realize that the soldier is kind of maybe injured, and you can't just be stiff. You have to go in there and kind of gently pick up the soldier. And uh, so we need to find an optimal PAM size and arrangement, uh, optimal kinetic configurations, various modeling aids, and also uh, we can scale for different applications and then uh, try to compete or surpass current state of the art actuation schemes. Now, the robots right now that are being used are using high pressure hydraulics. I'm talking things like 4,000, 5,000 psi. And we're trying to advocate using 100 PSI or 120 PSI PAM systems. Now, the hydraulic systems are hazy mat problems. If you have a leak, then it's a hazy mat problem. And the military doesn't want to have to go up and clean up all this leaky hydraulic oil, if at all possible. So basically, uh, we looked at several different control techniques, uh, mainly output feedback. 
looking at pity and fuzzy logic, I mean some model-based techniques based on uh, feedforward with torque, and then model-based with augmented with output feedback. I'm not gonna go through all the details of this, just to say that um, the combined approach seems to work best, and we've had good results with that. And I'll show you some examples. Uh, here's a robotic arm. This is actually one of the two manipulators that goes on to the battlefield casualty extraction robot. There'd be one that essentially goes in the knee level and one that goes around the shoulders. And here's the paddle that would be used to pick up the person. And uh, there's a series of PAMs in here. It can generate a lot of torque, which is really critical. It can generate a lot of torque in a static fashion, unlike electric motors. And you can see here, we can actually get quite good dynamic behavior out of this of the system with the controller that I just posed to you a second ago. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sure this movie's not gonna work either, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and jump out. Yeah. Just to show you how this works. So you'll see here, uh, Ryan is turning the knob, and this is all done basically by hand. We're just there's a controller that does the uh, tries to maintain the the paddle at a constant location, and he's adding various pieces of weight to it, and uh, it compensates to return the paddle back to its original condition. And this is funded by the army, by the way, in case you didn't realize that. So and. Uh, So you can see that it, it just controls the location or configuration of the, of the limb as best as it can. Okay, and we've actually picked up humans. Uh, here's Ryan Robinson, the graduate student working on this, and this is Kurt Clothair, my collaborator. No, these were not approved by our institutional review board. I'm sorry. Uh, this is, is human experimentation, but uh, they were really picked up uh, by these manipulators, um, and they weigh, uh, I know the exact weights, but he's a lot lighter than, than Ryan is, so it shows that they're able to be picked up. I don't have those videos available, but just to show you that they're, they are interacting with humans in a positive way. So <clears throat> the second te technology we're looking at is trailing edge flaps, and we want to design an actuation system based on PAMS that can go inside of uh, a helicopter blade and do a lot of different things, including on-blade vibration control, maybe even primary control. And we found that PAMs have enough authority to do this. Uh, they can fit in the blades and withstand the environment, and they have the endurance life suitable for dynamic control, and they can be precisely controlled at high frequency. And here's kind of a couple different concepts. Here we have a trailing edge flap concept where we have cord-wise PAM configuration, and here we have a span-wise configuration. This is for a Bell 407 blade. This is for an UH-60 blade. And uh, again, using the same kind of, uh, and so here is, is an example of a, a bench top showing how fast this can move. And uh, I'll kind of just show this real quick just to give you a feel for, this is a fairly large uh, inertia <clears throat> that's being moved, a large flap for a, especially an H60 blade. And you can see the, the PAMs moving back and forth in this situation. And this is done with, with muscles and there are tendons that connect to the, the hinge on this flap and that actuates the, the blade up and down. And you get very large motions here, pretty good frequency. And of course, I can't really show you high frequency because as you know, videos don't work too well. So I'll show you some data talking about this. And uh, uh, here's an example of the H60 blade. This is this actually configured in an H60 blade in the wind tunnel. And this is wind tunnel data. And <clears throat> what I'm showing up here is different, uh, essentially, dynamic pressures or Mach numbers associated with the test in the wind tunnel. And you can see here that we'd like to get around 10 degrees. And here's the one pared, this is the rotor RPM, and this is four pared, which is the main vibration component from a four-bladed rotor. And you can see we're getting adequate, this is the requirement, these bars are the requirement. We're getting enough control through out of this to do the vibration control, which is quite good. This is using, again, just very lightweight pans. Um, so we were able to satisfy both the angular range, so the, the flap deflection requirement, and the bandwidth for these applications. This also, for a, a Bell 407 blade, 
and you'll see a similar chart here. Here's the requirement that we had. And then uh, with the spring, which represented the full scale aerodynamic loading, we're able to get adequate actuation out of the system that would satisfy the requirements for this test. And this is currently still a development ongoing with, with uh, Bell Helicopter. And we also tested this in a uh, vacuum chamber in rotation. Now, one of the things about helicopters is that no one will believe you unless you whirl your actuation system. They'll say, well, you haven't whirled it yet or you haven't spun it, so um, you gotta do that first. We did this and we showed we, again, could get adequate actuation out of the system. Here's around 80% CF field. Unfortunately, I blew my slip ring on my vacuum chamber. I couldn't do 100%. <clears throat> Apologize for that. It took us about a year to replace the slip ring and then my student graduated during that time, so I couldn't actually finish this test. But it's pretty indicative that we get pretty good performance up to 80% uh, of the actual CF load. Here's some control type things. You can see here we're getting pretty good results uh, with trailing edge flaps using simple feedback control algorithms with some delay compensation in there and that seems to work pretty well. And we also did some uh, uh, tests. We ran this fatigue stand with three different actuators for uh, in this case about 125 million cycles and in the second case we did 250 million cycles. And I had to stop at 250 million cycles because my student said, uh, Dr. Rolla, can I please graduate? And I said, okay. So I couldn't go more than 250 million cycles. So I had to stop there. Uh, here's an example, uh, the contraction ratio. As you vary the number of cycles, these are millions of cycles, you can see the performance uh, does creep a little bit, but it's still pretty comparable. And so we had no visible damage except for a couple of broken fibers. And so uh, it, it was quite a successful test. With Kevlar, we went up to about 225 million cycles, and uh, so we're doing quite well with uh, fatigue tests. So we wanted to compare an example of a, of a servo actuator to some PAMs just to see how that worked. And uh, I think I'll skip these videos, but the idea, again, is you have this mechanism with this antagonistic pair. And I kind of want to show this chart right here. Here's an actuation cartridge. Here's a uh, energizer battery, a AAA battery, or a AA battery. And the key thought here is that here's the servo actuator, okay? At low frequency, or its static behavior is quite poor. It has very poor static performance. But the pans have very excellent static performance. And you can, you can actually match up the servo actuator with the PAM at high frequency, get comparable performance. But you have the added benefit of way superior static behavior. And this is great when you're deploying, say, a flap or a control fin or something on an aircraft. So uh, this was designed specifically for a particular application, and uh, the static requirement was actually way higher than what the servo actuator could do, so we're able to solve that problem with PAMs. Um, this is kind of a fun one here, so I'll show this video. Uh, this is an example of a spanwise morphing concept. Oops, I think this is the one here, yeah. And uh, so here we have a, essentially a scissors mechanism that might go inside of a, a rotorcraft blade with an elastomeric skin. And here we have just one PAM. And it can show you kind of how much uh, deflection you can get out of a, a device like this. And for some reason it's hopping along. Well, here you go. You can see it, very large deflections. So pretty simple mechanisms. Uh, with an actuator like this, and this actually fits inside the scissors mechanism, so you can put this inside of a rotor blade and do a spanwise morphing or some other morphing concept. Oh, down here, here we go. Along the way, um, I think it's really important to be an innovator as well as a scientist and an engineer. So. Along the way, I've tried to do patents where it made sense. This is actually a patent for using PAMs for control surfaces on wings and rotor blades. And as well, we patented the technique for uh, putting these end fittings on the PAMs. And so these patents are both, were both relatively recent. And, uh, but I think this is one of the things that we ought to be doing is doing innovation as well as um, science and engineering. So, in summary, I kind of want to just mention we have, you know, with these PAMs, 
Now, they have been around for a long time. We've tried to increase the bandwidth as much as we could to achieve uh, adequate bandwidth for aerospace applications. And they also show we get superior static performance over motors. And I think that's really a, a key issue here. Um, I think we've improved the design analysis as well as fabrication of these devices. And I think we've got some pretty good feedback control algorithms. We can do robotic manipulators, prosthetics and exoskeletons. We have different projects going on on this right now. And also some various uh, applications in UAVs and helicopter rotors. And uh, so I was asked to provide some, some advice or some thoughts about you know, various things. And so uh, my first picture here is get a haircut and find a real job, right? So I, have, I used to be in a rock band. I had bell bottoms, you know, and, and I took some advice from George Thorogood, who's actually a very good rock musician, if you know him. And uh, I think my day job worked out okay. So I'm pretty happy that I'm a professor at these days. And I gave up being a rock musician. Involve your lab in outreach. You know, one of the things we have to do is encourage youngsters to come into the engineering field. And that's a real important thing, K through 12. So I'm, I encourage my lab to go do a lot of outreach. And here you can see a lot of smiling faces. And uh, they're really enjoying going out. And we did an AAA. This is actually a science and engineering festival banner. And uh, we do this every year for the engineering, Engineers Week at the National Building Museum. And this wind tunnel is actually built by my daughter over a summer, we worked together and built this in the lab. And, uh, and my students go and they demonstrate drag races with hot wheel cars and things. It's a lot of fun. And we build thousands of air paper airplanes while we do this and test them in the wind tunnel. And the kids just love it. So go out and encourage engineers to join the field, young engineers. Make friends and try on some new clothes, OK? Go out and have some fun once in a while, right? And I, I want to thank uh, Professor Sung Bak Choi, I think he's here even. Uh, and uh, he's invited me to Inhai University a couple of times. And every trip's been fantastic. And, uh, and I can tell you that some of the most memorable occasions are actually having dinner. And uh, here's Professor Liu from Beijing and Sung Bak Choi and myself. Professor Jun and my, one of my former PhD students, you can't see him, Dr. Huang. And this is the first time I tried Wang Mandu. These are really large wontons. They're absolutely fabulous. So I still remember those wontons even almost 10 years later. Um, mentor students and colleagues. You know, one of my, one of my uh, I think, uh, pleas to people every time I have a meeting anywhere is nominate, nominate, nominate. You know, I nominated Professor Gong Wong for a, an award a number of years ago. I think he's here someplace. And uh, AAA, National Capital Section, Young Engineer Scientist of the Year Award. And he got this nice award, and I'm wearing my Albert Nippon suit. And uh, three years later, my other graduate student, uh, Greg Himmons, who's VP at Techno Sciences, won the same award, still wearing the same suit. Um, never got a raise in all those years. And then uh, Harinder Singh, my PhD advisee, actually, I nominated him for a Master of Science Research Award. He competed in and won an award. So, you know, if you help your students, uh, get these awards and participate in student competitions, their career will advance. So take the time to do this. So nominate, nominate, nominate. Take your former students with you. So I went to the 2012 ICAST. Encourage students to go to conferences. Have them give talks. And here's Ryan Robinson. We're in Nanjing. And uh, he gave a talk out in Nanjing. And uh, Peter, he was one of my postdocs. And Gong Wong is a former PhD student, now a young professor at Huntsville. And I got a hold of some money, and I dragged them all with me. Because I thought, why not bring young people, junior people, to an international conference and give them the experience of speaking before an international audience? It's a great experience, and we had a, a great time doing it. Take your family with you. I mean, I don't know if you do this, but I take my family all the time uh, on trips. We went to Bangalore in 2005. Of course, this is a number of years ago, and my daughters are all grown now. But um, went to the Maharaja's palace. And the greatest thing there was that we saw a different culture and learned about new things as a family. So that, that to me was a great experience. And it came about because of doing research. You know, one thing I want to mention here is life is full of great times. Don't miss them. 
we all worked really hard and spent a lot of time, but you know, uh, here my daughter Sophie, she's in Paris, and that's my wife, and they're enjoying uh, 10 weeks in Paris. Uh, of course, my wife went there for one week, but Sophie had a, 10 weeks there being a writer. And I was late for the conference here because my daughter was singing the role of Kim in Miss Saigon on Sunday night, and so I went there to see that show, and I ended up being here late on Monday, but I was not going to miss this for the world because that's, that's one of the most important things in life. Go see your, the plays that your children are in, get involved in these things, and, and enrich your life. My final thought is, go home for dinner, right? Go home, kiss your wife, kiss your kids, you know, make sure that you know they, they know you love them and, that it, you know, it's important. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to just show this final video of where we were a number of years ago when we started this project. And uh, actually, Giant Sirohi is actually here somewhere as well from University of Texas. He put this together. And, uh, and this is the video that we showed to the Army. Whoops. I'm going to say uh, edit or file. What do I do here? Full, full screen. View. Fit to screen. Here we go. This is where we started. This is the video we showed to the Army in order to develop the 407 actuation concept. And I don't know about you, but uh, I don't know why this is not working. Maybe it is working. The point is that we almost had no actuation out of this system. And uh, my computer seems to have. Well, here, I'll just do it like this. So you can see the, the amazing amount of actuation that we had out of this system. And the Army had enough faith in us that we could actually go and build a, a trailing edge flap system for a Bell 407 rotor blade out of this. So imagine the, the faith that we had from our sponsors. And we have to really thank our sponsors for having the vision to be able to see that there is something that we can do with something as preliminary as, as this. And uh, so I'm very grateful to Army Ames for funding us for many years on that particular project. So I'll go ahead and stop there, and if there are any questions. We do have time for a few questions. And And Norm, I'm going to kick one off if I could. It's just sure. a curiosity. Uh, when you're doing the helicopter uh, trailing edge flap, are you able to use static pressure from the front end of the blade to drive it, or are you having to fit pneumatics up through the slip ring? So we're actually using a uh, pneumatic slip ring. But these are actually uh, uh, common devices that are very robust, already available off the shelf. And so we have a plenum, and we run air up through a single hose into a manifold in the rotating frame, then we can feed all the different PAMs. And all your controls are then done below the rotor? Essentially, yeah. Well, the valving's in the rotating frame next to the PAMs, but the, the, the source is in the fixed frame. Uh, please. Um, I haven't done that. Uh, it's conceivable you could uh, could do that. The problem is that the extensile PAM is a very low force device compared to a contractile PAM. So with the extensile PAM, you would be fighting the stiffness of the contractile braid, and I think that would be difficult to do, but it, it could be possible. Yeah, the contraction direction is probably about a factor of 10, roughly, uh, greater in force than the extension. So. Just wondering if you can talk about uh, the main challenge in the technology out of this thing that you still have to overcome to replace the existing technology. Well, I think I think a lot of the issues that that come up here 
uh, which I didn't talk about, are things like uh, practical engineering requirements that you might need for a vehicle. So for example, for a helicopter, uh, typically you're having to validate your system design from minus 50 degrees up to say 160 degrees. And that's something you have to do. Uh, you have to uh, do EMI testing, typically. Uh, I think technically there are engineering challenges left in terms of developing kinematic systems. So we're looking at things like uh, uh, kinematic joint configuration. So we're using, I showed here a couple of circular uh, pulleys. In fact, you might want to use different kinds of pulleys, elliptical pulleys, for example, or cams. And we're looking at that quite heavily right now to improve performance. Uh, one thing you'd like to do is that as you contract, you'd like to reduce the lever arm on the antagonistic PAM to reduce that torque. And if you could come up with a CAM that reduced the torque on the antagonistic part, but increased the torque on the contractile or the agonist part, much more efficient system. Uh, I mean, there's a whole host of issues here. I don't think I could say them all in five minutes. I mean, there are, I mean, uh, for example, if you want to go to higher pressures, uh, some of the pneumatic valving that's available, proportional valving, is typically designed only to about 200 PSI. And so if you want to go higher than 200 PSI, you need to have uh, better valving tech and also potentially higher bandwidth valving, depending on the application. So really it depends on the, the application you're looking at. So far what we've done, I think the technology available right now off the shelf for valves and controllers uh, is, is quite good and we can use it quite well for what we're doing. Thank you. Yeah. How small um, Okay, so we've actually made, I don't know if you're a fisherman or not, but I, I go fishing occasionally and you can buy hollow silicone filament fishing line. Okay, it's, it's less than a millimeter in diameter. You can actually make PAMs from that. And uh, we've done that for uh, water-based or hydraulic artificial muscles and uh, also with air, so pneumatic artificial muscles. So it can be very, very small. Not, not to the scale of uh, probably you could, you could do with a, a solid state material, like a EAP, for example but certainly quite small. But you can get large forces, and as you make these things smaller also, the contraction drops. So for that scale of PAM, we're getting about less than, a bit less than 10% contraction, not the 30% I showed for the larger PAMs. So you do lose something as you get smaller. Another question, please. In, in, in what sense? Oh yeah, you can, you can do that. In fact, we uh, are, are looking at various applications of that. Uh, the problem is the, the pressures and uh, you higher pressures typically, and uh, you could in fact use fluids. The nice thing about air is you can move it a lot faster, and get higher bandwidth than I think hydraulics in, in this context, because you can move air very quickly. So the, the delay associated with moving air is a little bit lower than with hydraulics. But uh, it's certainly feasible to do it. There's no reason why you couldn't do it. In fact, people are using that technique. I know Ephraim Garcia has a couple of papers past year or so on hydraulic artificial muscles and Bell and Solano in France has a very nice surgical robot application where she's using water. So uh, the kind of water you use in patients, uh, saline water, and uh, they use that in a and a surgical robot using, using these kinds of pans. Uh, well, I think again, it depends. Oh, yeah, you probably could, depending on the valves. But hydraulics typically, it's, all of these things are governed by flow rate, right? So um, if you have a large pump, you can go as fast as you want, right? So how big a pump do you want to carry? So. Um, it depends. Uh, the nice thing about uh, compressors is you can actually compress air, put it into an accumulator, and run it off an accumulator and have a fairly small compressor. But for hydraulics, you actually need a very large pump to get high flow rates. So it's all the usual problems you have with hydraulics and pneumatics as far as flow rate 
comes into play, like any other uh, typical hydraulic or pneumatic cylinder. Well, with that, if we have no further questions, I'd like to thank Norm Worley again. It was an outstanding presentation. Very much appreciate it. Oh, thank you.